So we are looking now at, once again, the book of the Maccabees, the very first uh, comment on the uh, history of the holiday of Hanukkah. The mention in the text is about the warfare. No mention of the oil whatsoever. Mention of the, uh, of the temple being rededicated. And a modeling of an eight-day holiday after the holiday of Sukkot. Uh, and that, that's the earliest version that we have. A curious uh, element of the holiday of Sukkot and the holiday of Hanukkah is it's celebrated the very first time, uh, according to this apocryphal book. Um, Sukkot is celebrated, as uh, some of you probably know, with the taking of four types of produce. The Lulav, the Etrog, the Hadassim, the Aravot. Uh, the lulav, a palm branch, hadassim, myrtle, aravot, uh, which are willow branches, and the etrog, a, a citron, as it were. If you look at the text itself, um, how many types of produce do you see mentioned there? It's actually in uh, chapter 10, verse 7, if you're looking at the text from the book of Maccabees. We need to see some text pop up. How many types of produce did you see mentioned in that uh, apocryphal text that they took with them to celebrate Sukkot slash Hanukkah? Uh, maybe two, okay. We have any other uh, stabs at it? Math is not my strong point, but I, I was hoping we could do a little better. There you go, Patrick. Yeah, it does look like three. Uh, if you look at the text, it says bows, green branches, and palms. What seems to be missing is uh, is the etrog. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about it, because we're now in the middle of winter in Israel, or at least the beginning of winter, and etrog is not likely to have made it through the first frost, through the beginning of the winter time. Um, exactly. I'm thinking that it wasn't in season, wasn't easily obtainable. Um, and uh, long before greenhouses and all the rest. Let alone the fact that uh, today, and uh, this is may not have been the case back then, so many are actually imported from away. So they actually improvised and may do with three of the four types of produce and they celebrated their Sukkot out of place. They improvised, they uh, absolutely uh, reinvented uh, that holiday in order to be able to do something. Um, so now we're going to take a look uh, in a moment at the second text, the text from the Midrash. Uh, first, let's take a look at what some of the comments that were made were, because I think those will be instructive as well. Uh, if you go back, someone, as I was scrolling up, uh, Jeremiah uh, mentioned the Maccabees were the original Stern Gang, uh, referring to uh, the group of, well, uh, sort of more violent freedom fighters, or, or maybe if you want to consider them that, almost terrorist organization, the early Zionist movement. Uh, I'm not going to make a value judgment on that. Um, in a way, there's a lot of interesting truth to that. Uh, the early Zionist fighters absolutely saw themselves as freedom fighters, uh, saw themselves as uh, followers of the Maccabees, as those who were going to take the Jewish professionals and small business persons and reinvent Jewish people as the strongmen. Max Nordau, one of the early Zionist thinkers, spoke about the Jewish Superman, in effect. Uh, and the early Zionist literature showed pictures, portraits, of Jews who looked nothing like the shtetl Jews, but who really looked macho and looked like the new generation of pioneers and settlers and 
farmers. And in many ways, they had to look back to the most recent example of completely free Israelites. And that would go back to the time of the Maccabees. Um, once the Maccabees or the Hashmonian line loses power, which is not all that many years after the revolt, only a few generations later, there are no more fully independent Jewish states until 1948. So the early Zionists absolutely look back to the Maccabees as role models, in a sense. Uh, let's see what other questions we had in here. Um, lemons and lemon juice. Yeah, well, we are a practical people. Um, it's interesting. I, I, I don't really know the relationship between the citron and the lemon. It's, it's certainly a cousin of some sort. Uh, the practical chava is a really interesting comment uh, because they were clearly taking a biblical precept and transferring it to another place. Uh, it actually is very reminiscent of some of the early conversations that took place when commemorations that ranged from Yom HaShoah, uh, Holocaust Memorial, and Day of, um, of um, also recalling the uprisings and the resistance, uh, when Yom HaShoah came to existence, when Yom HaAtzma'ut, Israel Independence Day, came into existence, Yom Yerushalayim, Jerusalem Day, uh, there was considerable discussion as to who has the right to declare a new Jewish holiday uh, and who has the right to declare what prayers um, are going to be implemented for those new holidays. And it certainly would look to me as if the same discussions were taking place at this time as well. Uh, who has the right to do it? Who has the right to decide that we can celebrate sort of a modified Sukkot well after its season? And apparently they, they did take that initiative. Uh, interesting set of conversations. Going back to our text, this is Midrash, uh, most likely written uh, quite a bit after the time of the apocryphal text of the Maccabees. And it says, why do we kindle lights on Hanukkah? And the text answers, because when the sons of the Hashmonaim, the Hasmonians, the high priests, defeated the Hellenists, they entered the temple and found their eight iron spears. They stuck candles on them and lit them. So what we have here is the first mention of kindling lights. And this is most likely written a few hundred years after the revolt, most likely, although the tradition itself may have extended longer. Many traditions were not written down in a formal text until long after they had begun to be transmitted uh, orally from one person to the next and one generation to the next. Curiously enough, uh, in our time we see many modern Hanukkiot, Hanukkah menorahs, that actually show Maccabee soldiers, each holding a spear uh, and with a candle that you can insert. They are actually going back to this earliest version of the Midrash that speaks about the origin of lighting lights at this holiday. And we can also conjecture, of course, we're at the darkest point of the year. Uh, it's a time when just about every culture, or many cultures certainly, had a holiday of lights, a festival of lights, whether it was the ancient Druids, modern Christians, uh, Zoroastrians, just about uh, just a whole bunch of, of commonality, that at the time when the day looked the darkest, there was a holiday that celebrated light, or that called light into action. Uh, I, I think of this almost as a ritual type of way around seasonal affective disorder. Uh, at a time when, when things look darkest, we light lights. Uh, and somewhere in there are a whole bunch of wonderful Divrei Torah just waiting to be written. Um, so it appears that they came into the temple. They found within the temple iron spears. Uh, the text doesn't say this, but one can presume 
that the iron spheres belong to either the Greek Syrian Greeks or to uh, their sympathizers among the Israelites, among the Jewish people. And not only did they uh, take the spears, in spite of the fact that they had been fighting against the people who had originally held them, but they made with those spears something that they themselves sanctified and lit fires upon those spears. We don't know the, um, the specifics of it. We don't know whether it was... I mean, this happens to say candles. I don't know if that's actually a literal translation. The the ancient word for candles and lights are, are really pretty much the same word, nair. So we don't know whether it may have been uh, a torch of some sort or whether it may have been um, more of a candle type of implement. But nonetheless, that's what they did. Um, any comments or questions? The, the chat has gone a little bit quiet. Um, any comments or questions up until here? So in a moment, we're going to see how the holiday develops even further and how a lot of the elements of what we now know as Hanukkah actually go back to some of these early texts that no one really knows that much about because uh, we don't teach it in Hebrew school and it doesn't appear in the uh, little book of Hanukkah that I think was the book I learned about Hanukkah from in my childhood. So uh, what we're going to do now is take a look at the next classical text. And this is one that some of you may be more familiar with because it does come from, uh, or it does appear, I should say, in our Siddur, our contemporary prayer book. Uh, it's inserted during the holiday of Hanukkah as part of the Amidah silent prayer and is also recited in the traditional Birkat HaMazon, the traditional grace after meals. We thank you for the miraculous deeds and for the redemption and for the mighty deeds and saving acts performed by you, as well as for the wars which you waged for our ancestors in ancient days at this season. In the time of the Hasmonean Matityahu ben Yochanan, the high priest, and his sons, when the Greco-Syrian kingdom rose up against the people Israel to make them forget Torah and to turn them away from the ordinances of your will, then you in your abundant mercy rose up for them in times of trouble, pled their cause, executed judgment, avenged their wrong, and delivered the strong into the hands of the weak, the many into the hands of few, the impure into the hands of the pure, the wicked into the hands of the righteous, the insolent ones into the hands of those occupied with your Torah. You made a great and holy name in your world for yourself, and for your people you achieved a great deliverance and redemption. Whereupon your children entered the sanctuary of your house, cleansed your temple, purified your sanctuary, kindled lights in your holy courts, and appointed these eight days of Hanukkah in order to give thanks and praises unto your holy name. What you start to see in this text is the beginning of a merger of two elements of Hanukkah. You continue to see the war, the battles, as the key element uh, of, the, of what had gone on. This prayer is actually the first text we're looking at tonight and the earliest written of the texts that we're aware of or that we have in our hands that refer to Nisim, that refer to miracles. Uh, the texts until now were grateful and spoke of thanksgiving and rededication, but not of miracles. The miracle here, though, is still the miracle of the battle, of the uprising, of the resistance. Candles are lit, lights are kindled, but once again, uh, what's missing from this version that we recite to this day? I'm watching the text box. Is 
if you look at Al Hanisim, the prayer we just read, uh, what element is still missing from the account? There you go. Okay. Ah, interesting. So uh, there, were, there are a few different answers that, that came in here. Um, Shmu, I love that you uh, uh, picked up on Nisim as, as your middle name. Um, God is absolutely missing. Uh, the eight days of oil, the oil that doesn't last. Um, and and once again, um, this this is something we're still reciting to this day. We're reciting a prayer all eight days that do not even begin to mention um, the miracle of the um, of the oil. So uh, we're now going to go into the last of the texts, and this is from Talmud Shabbat. Uh, the the part of the Talmud that we're looking at here actually uh, goes back. To, have to excuse me, just getting rid of our phone uh, uh, phone call here. Um, what we're now looking at is a text that's written in roughly the 5th century thereabouts, uh, some elements a little earlier, some a little later, uh, that is uh, very clearly um, written no less than 500 years, 600 years, or even 700 years after the time of the story. Um, there is a, uh, a great uh, question that one of you asked um, relevant to uh, whether God is there uh, in al Hanisim, uh, And it's a very good question. Is the prayer directed at God? Is he involved nonetheless? Uh, it's a great question because the same question actually occurs in the story of the holiday of Purim. Uh, the entire book of Esther is the only book of the Bible in which God's name does not appear. God's presence in the story is hidden from view. Uh, presumably, you're right. Presumably, the word nace assumes God's presence, although the word nace also means a sign, something that has happened publicly that makes one aware that something special is taking place. Uh, but usually, it's much more conscious. But it, it, it's a great point for discussion. Um, so now we're going to look at the Talmud, and um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, um, just because um, I want to make sure we get to the key elements. So I want to go down a few paragraphs to the text that begins, What is Hanukkah? And it's several paragraphs down in this text. Uh, actually, no, you know what, I'm sorry. Let me go three lines uh, down in the text, three paragraphs down, to our rabbi's talk. That actually is where we'll, where we'll begin. About three paragraphs down. Our rabbis taught the precept of Hanukkah requires one light for a person and his household. Now, this literally means that the actual law of Hanukkah, and this in fact is the law technically, is that in any one household, only one person needs to light one light each and every night of Hanukkah. One light the first, one light the second, one light the third, one person for his whole household. And that is actually the technical law. The zealous, those who want to be more um, conscious of the requirement, light one for each member of the house. So again, now what's happening is every person in the house is lighting one candle the first night, one candle the second night, one candle the third night, etc. Well, this again is acceptable. Um, it's not required, but we go even a step further. And this leads to the next conversation. Sh uh, Hillel and Shammai are two ancient rabbis. Each of them establish a school or a, a school of thought, actually, with many thousands of students and followers. Those in turn have many tens of thousands of students and followers. And these schools of thought disagree on how the ideal, ideal way of lighting is. 
Um, the extremely zealous, the text continues, uh, have two schools of thought. The school of Shammai says, on the first night, eight lights are lit, and then they're gradually reduced. So you go eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, on successive nights of the holiday. This is for those who want to do it in the most extremely uh, exacting way. The school of Hillel says, on the first day, one is lit, and afterwards, they are progressively increased. So one lights one the first night, then two, then three, and so on. Um, and of course, which is the, of these four different options, which is the one that we actually follow for the most part? Adding one each right. Thank you, Tamara. So indeed, we follow the, the tradition of Hillel, um, not the original rabbinic tradition that said just one per household. Um, uh, and um, you're absolutely right. Uh, we generally follow Hillel. There's actually one portion of Talmud that specifies those few areas in which Shammai's opinion, which is generally the stricter, is followed. And there's a, a lot of stories around Hillel and Shammai. We're not going to go down that tangent uh, right at the moment because um, the reasoning is now going to become of, of great interest to us. Um, Ula, who is a later generation of uh, authorities said that in the West, in the land of Israel, uh, he was clearly teaching uh, in Babylonia, and Israel was to the to the west of him. Two Amoraim, two Gemara era teachers, Rav Yossi ben Avin and Rav Yossi ben Zvida, have different opinions about the different opinions. Uh, that is to say, they're each trying to become part of the conversation, as we spoke about earlier, that that in effect, when we study Jewish texts, we are becoming part of a, of, of a conversation, part of a networking uh, event that's taking place. In this case, the networking is extending now from Hillel and Shammai um, to um, Ula by way of Rav Yossi Barabin. So you can actually see three generations networking. And the conversation has now gone from Babylonia, well, from Israel to Babylonia and back to Israel again. So um, the networking that takes place in, in this story and in many stories cuts across miles and cuts across years. Uh, and in this case, uh, the knowledge that now comes to the forefront is what the, re what the rationale were. So one of these two, one of these two Rav Yossi, it was a common enough name, says that Beit Shammai's rationale in going 8765432 is it corresponds to the days still to come. And that is, we're counting down the days. Beit Hillel says, no, we're counting the days that have already passed. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. That's a pretty simplistic reason. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The other Rav Yossi says, this is what the disagreement between Hillel and Shammai was about. Bet Shammai says, the number of lights corresponds to the bullocks order, uh, who, that were offered, excuse me, as part of the offerings on the holiday of Sukkot. On the holiday of Sukkot, the number of sacrifices, the number of bulls offered, actually descends each day of the holiday. There is less and less until you get to the last day. And Beit Shammai says that that's the reason. There's a parallel. Beit Hillel says, Ma'alim B'Kodesh V'Lom that in general, and this is a, a very typical rule, it's, it's a rule that occurs in many places, in matters of sanctity, we always seek to do better, to increase, and not to decrease. Now, I want to go back for a second to Shammai's, to 
this particular interpretation of Shammai's original belief. Because if one studies this ver this part of the Talmud, um, and we promised you a mashup between uh, Shabbat, Sukkot, and Hanukkah, and this is where the mashup occurs. The very first time I studied this, um, it was really very interesting to me. First of all, the whole question of where does Hanukkah appear, uh, or what is Hanukkah all about, appears in this particular segment of the Talmud that deals with Shabbat. Literally in the middle of a conversation about what fuel can you use for the Shabbat light, this conversation about Hanukkah uh, emerges. So that idea of comparing one light to another uh, is actually comes front and center. And there are actually those, and this opinion is not accepted, there are those who say that only the light that can be used for the Shabbat light can be used for the Hanukkah light, where eventually the law rules that you can use anything for a Hanukkah light. Um, but many have gone back to the original practice of lighting oil in the same way that the menorah in the temple used oil as fuel. Um, so you have that Shabbat Hanukkah mashup. But now Shammai introduces us once again to the Sukkot and Hanukkah mashup. Now, what doesn't appear in this version of the story um, in the Talmud? Or what doesn't appear central to the story at any, at any rate? Shmoo, great questions. There are two great questions here. What, what, first of all, the answer is that what appears, at least so far, is, vir is no real mention of the war, but a very clear uh, understanding of the importance of lighting the Hanukkiah, the menorah. Um, Shmoo, that, you asked a great question. You put into the text, uh, does this mean that only one, not one light constitutes the mitzvah uh, or are the rest of the light sacred too? So the simple answer is that with one light you have fulfilled the obligation, but as long as you are choosing to light the Hanukkiah with multiple lights, all of them absolutely become holy and sacred and become part of that same mitzvah, uh, which is the reason that one cannot use any of the eight standard lights in the menorah uh, for a secular use, and there is the reason that we light the shamash, so that we're not using the light of the Hanukkiah for anything else, including for lighting one candle to the next. Uh, it's a great question. Um, is the oil recent? Um, no, one can actually go back to all to many of the early menorahs that. Uh, one would see whether in Israel or in the Israel Museum or any Jewish museum. And oil was used in many, many places. Um, but I would say there's been a, a popularization uh, that has, uh, you know, come back into this again. Um, importance develops from tradition. Chava, over time, meaning evolves. I really love what you're saying. Um, so my belief, and again, it's only my belief, uh, I, I don't quote this as, as absolute uh, Torah, uh, but my belief is that we imbue actions with sanctity. Um, and even the same action may be imbued with very different kinds of sanctity at different points in history. And I'll give you a prime example of that. Uh, keeping kosher. Maimonides believed that we keep kosher because certain foods are healthy for the body and the soul. Um, early Reformed Judaism said, well, if kashrut was about health, um, any, we now know that any food is healthy and we no longer need kashrut. So ka keeping kosher became reinterpreted and ultimately became repopularized within the Reformed community as well, or some elements of the Reformed community as it was reinvented as having nothing at all to do with health considerations, but having to do with how do we exercise self-control 
or separation, etc. Um, and I would say that Jewish traditions over the course of time become reinterpreted and reimbued with meaning. The Shabbat lights are a prime example. The early kindling of lights for Shabbat had a lot to do with the very practical reason of wanting to have light on Shabbat. Uh, and only later did it, be, did it become only a ritual. Until then, it was a very practical kind of purpose. So we really do reinvent um, Jewish practices. Uh, and in, in much the same way that I mentioned some of what went on with um, the early Zionists looking back to Hanukkah for a way of, of defining who they were. It was a reinvention in certain ways of Hanukkah itself. So, first of all, uh, for many years, until I discovered those early texts from Book of the Maccabees, etc., I never understood why Shammai was suddenly bringing up Sukkot. But now, reading between the lines, I have to wonder whether, in fact, uh, he was quite aware of those earlier ancient texts that uh, supposed that Hanukkah was modeled after the holiday of Sukkot to begin with. And so he brings that into the whole discussion seemingly out of nowhere, but now that we've looked at these texts, it's not so out of nowhere anymore. Um, let's uh, skip another paragraph and just go down to um, the paragraph that begins, What is Hanukkah? What is Hanukkah? When the Hellenists entered the temple, they desecrated all of the oil. And when the Hasmonean dynasty grew and defeated them, they searched but found only one cruise of oil sealed with the stamp of the high priest, and there was only enough in it to burn for one day. A miracle ha happened, and it burned for eight days. The next year, they made these days a fixed annual commemoration, including the recitation of Hallel and giving thanks. Now, that's the rabbinic version of the story written down in, again, let's say the 4th, 5th, 6th centuries. Um, and there, the miracle of the oil is first introduced now, what's also interesting is that this is the point at which Jews are furthest from any kind of self-government. They are uh, under Roman rule very clearly. They're living in a, in, a, in a tense peace with the Romans. But unlike the earlier texts, which were either written under Jewish self-government or under some semi-autonomy, this is the first that's really written in many ways in a diaspora type of environment. Either they're already living in the land of Babylonia or they're in the land of Israel under Roman rule. Um, so my assumption, and it's only an assumption, it's an educated guess, is that the rabbis of the Talmud did not want to appear like troublemakers. They were only a few hundred years from two devastating rebellions against the Romans. One was the so-called Jewish War against the Romans, uh, which was what resulted in the destruction of the Temple in the year 70 CE. The other was the Bar Kokhba Revolt in the second century, uh, both of which were just incredibly um, um, demoralizing and, and terrible defeats. And it's entirely possible that the rabbis wanted to de-emphasize rebellion uh, in this story in order not to upset the Roman authorities, and instead made the miracle of oil much more, well, in, I don't want to say invented it, but certainly brought it to prominence. And they also, by this point, ordained that there would be uh, blessings recited, and they took a huge innovative step, because in another part of the Talmud it speaks about, and you'll have this in the written text, but we don't have time to go over it in depth tonight. Uh, in another part of the text, it discusses, why would you say a blessing? Thank you, God, for commanding us to light the light of Hanukkah. Uh, in fact, 
the holiday of Hanukkah is not commanded by God in the Torah. And these blessings are generally for mitzvot that come from the Torah itself. So the rabbis and the authorities actually took uh, a tremendously innovative step by, by saying, no, this is also uh, a light upon which you recite a blessing. And this is also a holiday that in spite of not being biblical, we say the blessing for recitation of the hollow prayers. Uh, it was a very innovative step. Um, it also is, is very consistent with the fact that the rabbis of this time invented what I would call Judaism as a religion. Uh, prior to that time, Judaism or Jewish was part of a nationality and, and you were governed Jewish, you studied Jewish, you lived Jewish, you spoke a Jewish language, Hebrew or Aramaic, which was a more or less a cousin of Hebrew. Um, by the time of the Talmudic period from the second century on, the early rabbis had to take what was until then a, a government and instead create a Jewish that could be fit easily into their suitcases, that could go into diaspora with them, uh, and that would give them parity with other religions and not necessarily with other nationalities. Uh, so again, it, it, this was a whole process, not only of reinventing Hanukkah, but of inventing the synagogue instead of the temple, prayer instead of, uh, of uh, sacrifices, offerings. Uh, there was a tremendous amount of, of reinvention and innovation going on over these few centuries, uh, including the, the Talmud as a text as a means of understanding the Torah itself. So reinventing Hanukkah actually fits perfectly into that context. Uh, we're almost at our closing time. Let's take a look at some of the questions that you folks have put up there. Um, um, let's see. Yes, um, Shmu, you're absolutely right. In the text itself um, of the Talmud, it says one of the reasons that the rabbis were given the power of, of at least some degree of innovation, uh, and there are actually seven mitzvot, I believe, traditionally ascribed to rabbinic uh, authority and not to biblical authority uh, is from a verse that says, at, well, there's from two places. One says, ask your father and your elders and they will tell you, um, meaning that, uh, yes, we learn from precedent and we also learn from those who um, who have come before us. And there's, there's a lot of discussion of what that means. Uh, and another text, which actually is biblical in nature, which which implores people to go to the judges of your generation, ask them, and they will tell you, meaning that the rabbinic authorities of any generation have the ability to speak with some degree of authority. Um, ah, relationship of tradition and authority. Great question. Uh, no simple answer, and I think um, I think what you'll see is that one of the differences among Jewish philosophy is the question of authority and tradition. There are some great, um, uh, very high intellect kind of books that have been written on the whole nature of authority in Judaism. Uh, where What's the point at which uh, common practice becomes an authoritative Jewish law or, or tradition? Uh, we would probably go into shock if we saw someone simply lighting one Hanukkah candle on the eighth night uh, and not lighting eight, because what's become, in a sense, authoritative is the practice that people have used. And as far back as the Talmudic era, um, rabbis sometimes made authoritative decisions based on visiting a community and saying, and, and literally this would be stated in the text, go to thus and such a town and see how the people practice there. And oftentimes they would take what they saw being practiced and make that into the authoritative tradition. At the same time, there were times that rabbis attempted to enact a new law and found that people were not accepting of that law. And there are many instances of this. And they considered those to be 
Gezeira Shein Harov Yecholim La'amod Ba, a rabbinic enactment that the majority of people just can't handle. And that actually, that idea that people would vote with their feet, if a rabbinic law was enacted and people voted with their feet not to follow it, it could actually uh, override and overrule that rabbinic enactment. So um, we do, in fact, as, as Jews, we do live in a place where um, what, what is common practice or tradition and what is sanctified or godly are always interfacing and interacting in some really interesting ways. Uh, one of the most famous stories, actually, uh, which we've actually studied in some of the one shul punk Torah classes before, is one in which two rabbis are arguing, and ultimately uh, one tries to outdo the other by proving he's right through miracles that occur. And eventually a, a heavenly voice comes down and says, uh, we don't follow miracles, we don't follow a heavenly voice even. Um, well, actually, the heavenly voice comes down to try to prove this one rabbi is right. And, and the other rabbi simply counters with, we don't follow a heavenly voice. Uh, it's in your hands. And that actually uh, is something that comes from the Torah itself. Uh, Lo ba shamayin he, it's not in the heavens, but it's in your hands. Um, so there is that constant dynamic interaction between the uh, godly and the human, even in terms of how Jewish is practiced. And uh, that, by the way, is true whether one considers themselves Reform, conservative, orthodox, post-denominational. Um, there are elements of that. And absolutely, uh, there is power of the people. Uh, there are literally biblical laws that are no longer followed because the rabbis overrule them because of things going on in their society. Um, and similarly, there are mitzvot that the rabbis enacted. And uh, the question very often um, becomes, which authorities have what ability? And in today's day, where uh, we are so much in control of what we learn and what we do, um, you know, what is the authority of the individual to shape his or her own Judaism. And that's a whole long conversation. Um, suffice it to say that in my uh, rabbinic practice and in my um, Jewish life coaching practice and in my education work, uh, I have moved my role from being an authority to being much more a facilitator and coach uh, and guide to what some of the texts and some of the considerations are. Uh, rather than trying to be that authority. And I, I, I think we're moving into a generation where that's going to prove to be more and more true. Uh, I'm going to take a look at um, some of these. Uh, let's see what we have here. We have a question from Mimi Miriam. Uh, the eight days are the earliest part of the holidays. They, they do seem to be. Uh, historically, they do seem to um, come before the... Um, the miracle of the oil is mentioned at least. Um, this, uh, and we don't really know what the species, the three species they took were. I, I would like to believe that they were taking species that were uh, of the original biblical nature, but we don't know that for sure. That's a great question. Um, evergreen bows. Aha! That's a very interesting chidush, a very interesting uh, uh, innovative question. Um, I, I suspect not, because I believe that the bows as the trees actually originated not from early Jewish Christians, but I believe um, came by way of Druids. Um, but again, um, quite possible that just as there was this idea of bringing light into the darkness of this time of year, there may have also been a shared desire to bring greenery and life into a time when most produce was dying. So th those underlying themes may have some uh, distant commonality. I wouldn't uh, necessarily say no. Uh, any other closing questions before we finish up?
If not, I would like to thank all of you for being part of this in a very active way. Uh, I've enjoyed the conversation that's taken place through the chat. I uh, hope uh, we got to everyone's question. Ah, lighting candles for non-Jews. Excellent. So um, there would not really be, uh, because there's really no obligation of someone who's not Jewish uh, to light uh, a, Chanuk, a Chanukah menorah, so one would not really have to, the members of the household. Uh, it's a great question, particularly in interfaith families. Does the person who is not of the Jewish faith but is part of a Jewish family uh, choose to light or not? So I'm, uh, because again, I, I have declared myself to be more of a facilitator of learning than an authority. Uh, I'm going to dodge that one. I think it's a, it's a fascinating question. Uh, and I think families are finding their own answers to that. It's a really wonderful question. Um, and and I, I really do feel that each family, to some extent, has to answer that for themselves. Uh, just as, to some extent, um, answering the question of whether Hanukkah is about an uprising and, or nationalism or religion or miracles of oil is a question that each of us uh, answers to themselves. Um, these are all great questions, and uh, Mimi Miriam, you're welcome. Um, I, I just saw the Todah Rabbah on there. Um, it is really a pleasure and an honor once again uh, to be a part of Punk Torah um, One Shul, and I remind you um, to uh, consider a donation at this time of year to help Punk Torah One Shul do its work. Uh, particularly now that we're uh, at the end of December and everyone has to make sure they have enough deductions to lessen their tax liabilities, help uh, help Patrick put a roof over his head and uh, keep offering these kinds of great programs. Um, and uh, Patrick is just giving you the link there, so there it is. Um, and um, also, uh, once again, if you look back at the text that we had, uh, I encourage you to feel free to connect up with me. Uh, my Facebook page is Jewish Connectivity. I'm on Twitter at Jewish Connective. Uh, personal Facebook is Arnie Samlin, and I'm LinkedIn at Arnold D. Samlin. That's all written up on that text. Uh, and it would be my pleasure to hear from you. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm actually that I'm flattered uh, at the question of when I'll do another class. And uh, the answer generally is, that whenever Patrick asks me, I do my best to try to make myself available and uh, will continue to do so. I love you guys, and um, and I do thank you for that. We will certainly let you folks know. Um, and in the meantime, between classes, feel free to connect up with me in any of the above ways. And uh, I want to wish each and every one of you a very uh, joyous Hanukkah uh, and a Hanukkah that you are able to share with uh, friends, uh, with loved ones, with family, um, and uh, really all the best to each and every one of you. Continue to spread light, even in this dark season of the year. Uh, good night.